Before the Day Ends in our series on Matthew. This is episode 7, and we're going to be getting into the Gospel of Matthew today. If you haven't caught up on the other material, you can just go to our Rumble site and you can see all the videos get caught up there. A couple of announcements before we get started. Um, I want to let you know that the hardback of our book is now available. You can find that on Amazon. Um, in the back are some small group resources, and we've had some folks uh, contact us and said that they are working very well for their small group. So just be aware that they're there in the appendix. There's uh, small group questions for every uh, chapter and section in the book, and so that might help you as you are looking for new material for your small group. Also, for these videos, I've added a contact us page on our website, beforethedayends.org, and the purpose of that is if you have any questions you want to ask us about what we're talking about, or maybe ideas for uh, future videos, or just a general question, anything like that, we're just looking to build some community with um, our Before the Day Ends crowd. So again, just you can check that out. It's under the Contact Us page on our website. All right, like I said, we're getting into the Gospel of Matthew today, and we're starting in Chapter 1. Before we do that, I want to point out that we're going to kind of following this outline we presented last time um, that has this five-fold view of how Matthew puts together his gospel, that he's kind of following the outline of the Torah, the five books of the Torah. And so each of these books, if you will, um, has a narrative section, something that Jesus uh, does, followed by a section that has something he teaches or he talks about. So this narrative and discourse pair makes one book, and there's five of these uh, scattered throughout. Again, the details are in our last video. Um, so we're going to be starting off in chapters 1 through 4, which is the birth and beginnings narrative section in book 1 of Matthew. Now typically, when you start off a book, you want a hook. You want something that's going to attract attention, get people excited about what you're doing. Matthew really, it seems, it seems doesn't do that. He starts off with a genealogy, you know, uh, this long list of names that we typically sk skip uh, names that we don't pronounce very well these days, and so we kind of just skip over it and move on to the birth of Jesus. However, Matthew actually introduces some major themes in the genealogy that are important. He's going to introduce uh, some, not just themes, but ideas and concepts that he's going to hit again and again and again in his gospel. and uses the genealogy to kind of set us up and give us a look toward those things. So, um, in our 10-minute section here, we don't have time to read the genealogy, so I encourage you to do that. You can stop, stop the video here and then just come back when you're done uh, and look through those names and what is going on in the Gospel of Matthew's genealogy. All right, so again, we have more than just a list of names. How he presents the genealogy is incredibly important. And one of the first signs of the genius that goes into how Matthew puts this Gospel together. So in chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, we have the genealogy. And it has this kind of what we call a ring device. It's it going to kind of begin and end with the same idea. In fact, Matthew's gospel does that as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. So Matthew 1, 1, it says this, An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So we have two important names mentioned there, David and Abraham, which we heard a few episodes ago. Now, look at the last verse of this section, Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David, those are two names again, are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So here again, David and Abraham are two important folks from Jewish history that have important covenants or promises from God given to them, right? So we have with Abraham, the promise of a nation and a people and land 
and then for David, that there'll be someone from his family on the throne forever. So who's missing in this? Well, there's one person that we mentioned, again, a few episodes ago, that has a major covenant given to him, and it's not listed here. Who is that? Well, hold that for a second. I'll give you a hint. This guy doesn't need a boat to cross a lake. Just a little hint on who we're talking about. All right, back to verse 17. The genealogy as a whole is divided into three sets of 14, right? He says there's 14 generations um, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the deportation to Babylon, and 14 from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah. 14 generations mentioned three times. Well, one of the problems is um, that these don't fit into actual units of time. So we look at these spans from Abraham to David, David to the deportation, deportation to Jesus. There's pretty big differences in years. So, for example, we have 750 years for that first segment, 400 for the second, 600 for the third. So you're talking a 350-year swing in one case. You really can't squeeze 14 generations into or out of. So these numbers he's using are playing a very important role of what he's trying to say. Okay. So why is he doing this? Well, if you look at my book um, in the chapter entitled Halfway There, I talk a lot about how numbers play an important role in the Bible. Numbers like 40 or 3, and in this particular case, the number 7. The number 7 plays an important role because it has the idea of completion or wholeness. Or we see it in the seven-day week. The seven-day week doesn't fit into any lunar or solar calendar, hence leap year. But it does have the idea of being complete. So the number seven plays a very important role throughout the Bible. And if you look here in this case, we have 14 generations, three times. So seven times two is 14. So we have two sevens in each 14. And then three 14s give us six sevens. So if we have six sevens built up from Abraham to the Messiah, what's the seventh seven? That's well, Jesus' generation. He completes everything. It's whole. It's perfect. This is what history was moving toward, what it's coming to, the seventh seven. And so this genealogy is setting up this concept that Jesus is the completion of all the stuff that's gone before. He's the completion of that. Another important theme that we have in Matthew's gospel is that Jesus is going to break boundaries. Traditional boundaries, boundaries in society, he's going to break those to create his kingdom. He's going to Bring the Gentiles, the outsiders, into the kingdom. He is going to um, take traditional wind rules and reshape them as part of his kingdom. So, for example, in the genealogy, we see four women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. All were considered outsiders. Ruth, for example, is a Moabite. Um, Rahab was a Canaanite. So these are outsiders to the kingdom outsiders to the Jewish people, rather, and they're brought into the kingdom of God. Something else that goes on, not just with these four. Now, again, these four women we read about have kind of skeletons in their closet, as do other folks in the genealogy that have a lot of issues, if you will, in their history. But they're part of Jesus' family. Well, guess what? We have issues, too. We have things in our closet that would keep us, in a sense, out of the family. But Jesus brings us in, makes us part of the family. And so we see these boundaries being broken and a community being created. Another big theme um, that's very important in this genealogy is the idea that Jesus is called Emmanuel. We see this at Christmas time, right? O come, O come, Emmanuel. It's Hebrew for God with us. So it begins with this very idea that Jesus, the God, is going to be with us. And this comes from Isaiah chapter 7. If you go back to Isaiah, there is a prophecy that Isaiah is talking to the king. And there's King Ahaz is worried about what's called the Syro-Ephraimite coalition. Syria and Ephraim, the northern kingdom, are coming to attack Judea and Judah, the, the, the southern kingdom. And he's worried about it. And so... There's this little section here in Isaiah 7 that kind of is going to set up this idea of Emmanuel. Let's take a look at that. In Isaiah 7, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as Sheol 
or as high as heaven. He says, look, ask God anything, whether it's big or small, ask him something big. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Which is pretty humble, right? Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. So he's going to say, I'm going to give you a sign about this coalition that's coming against you. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and he shall and shall name him Emmanuel. There's that word, God with us. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. So what he is saying is this. Before this child, who will be called Emmanuel, can know how to choose good from evil, when he's still super young, this will all be done. So the sign is this child, whoever this child is, will be born, named Emmanuel, before he's old enough to choose kind of right and wrong when he's still super young, this will be up, over. Now, this passage then has what's called, what we call two levels of fulfillment. It was fulfilled in Isaiah's day with King Ahaz in that context, but then it's used later for our context as this precursor to the identity of Jesus. That, yeah, war is coming with sin and death, and yet Jesus is going to come as God with us to give us hope, and rescue in the midst of all that. So it is very critical then that how this text is used to say that God is coming to the war that we're fighting, we're in the midst of, that we're losing against sin. Now this idea of Emmanuel shapes the entire gospel. It's here at the beginning, but it's also at the very end. In Matthew 28, 20, before Jesus leaves the earth, the last thing he says to us and to his disciples is this, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And that idea of God being with us, of Jesus being with us, is going to shape what Matthew's trying to tell us. He's saying, look, you're not alone in this. That we have a God who decided to come and be actually with us. And that's all coming true now in this seventh generation, if you will, the seventh moment in history, the completion of God actually being with us to the very end of the age is what Matthew is trying to teach us in the genealogy. Have a great day. 